Hi, my name is Tanya Joshua. I'm the Deputy Director of Policy at the Office of Insular Affairs in the U.S. Department of the Interior. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of OIA Conversations, where we speak with leaders and officials to learn more about programs and issues that are important and relevant to the U.S. territories and the freely associated states. The Marshall Islands remains one of the few areas in the world without cases of COVID-19, and its borders have been closed to travel since March of last year. Today, we are speaking with the Secretary of Health for the Republic of the Marshall Islands, Mr. Jack Niedenthal. Good, Yakwe Secretary. Thank you for yeah. joining us. Yakwe, yeah, Tanya, thank you for having me today. Um, so please, maybe could you start by telling us, give, give, paint a picture for us, please, uh, what has been happening in the Marshall Islands uh, since the beginning of, of the, the pandemic? Well, it's quite a picture to paint. One thing people have to understand about the Marshall Islands right now with regard to health is we've been in a state of health emergency for 20, almost 20 months. Uh, we had an issue in August of uh, 2019 when we had an outbreak, a very serious outbreak of dengue fever. Dengue fever, uh, when you only have one case, it's considered an outbreak. And this happened in August of 19, uh, 2019. It started on Ibai, came to Madro. We declared a state of health emergency. And it was brutal. We had, to date, uh, over 4,400 cases. And those are cases that are reported. Dengue fever has a 70% asymptomatic rate where nobody gets symptoms. So we probably had over 10,000 cases. And it was very scary. Our hospital was packed. Um, at one point, we were having over 200 cases a week. And this was went right into the end of the year of uh, December and out here in the Marshalls, we have Christmas time and people practice their dances and everything. So by the time we hit January of 2020, um, it was the worst part of the, uh, the outbreak. And during that time, the other thing people have to understand about what was going on here with regard to health, this was at a time when it was flu season. So we kept having outbreaks of flu, which presents in much the same manner as dengue fever did. So we really had our work cut out for us. And so we had two, two flu outbreaks during that time. And if you remember also late in 2019, there was a huge outbreak of measles that swept throughout the Pacific. It killed 82 people in Samoa, most of those little kids. So in early, early December, we closed our borders. You could not come in here if you did not show evidence that you either had measles or you've been had two uh, doses of uh, uh, the vaccine for measles. And that went right through to March. So before, so, before COVID even hit, you were already battling um, disease and, and, and working that way. Yeah, and dengue fever is a very serious disease because when somebody gets that, you have to monitor it, uh, the platelets of the, the patient every hour. So our hospital was packed. And the amazing thing was we were now down to zero or one case a week. We're almost done with it. Um, but we're still fighting it. Um, it's a dangerous disease. And uh, I can still remember late in 2019, we had our first death. It was a little 11, 12 year old girl. And I can tell you that when we had the meeting that day after that happened, uh, everybody was in tears, even just one death. It was a horrible thing for us. And we became really determined not to let that happen again. Uh, the statistics, Statistically, when you look at dengue fever, it has, there's a lot of fatalities. And even though we had somewhere around 10,000 cases, if you count the asymptomatic cases, we only had a total of two unfortunate deaths. And that's a real big tribute to the people I work with, really incredible people. Um, I'm really impressed. Um, but, but going into January, we were really struggling. And all of a sudden, we started hearing about this outbreak in Wuhan, China. And we became really concerned about that. And as we moved into February and it was spreading very quickly, we were putting countries, we were issuing travel advisories and putting countries on our list every couple of days at one point. Um, when in the beginning it was like Italy and of course China and Japan and uh, Iran in the beginning. And so we were, as soon as we saw community spread in a country, we put it on a travel advisor. And that became really critical for us. And it became, people were really, well, what are you doing this for? You're blocking these people from coming. Even here, people were really upset with us. And then in uh, early March, we had our first, what's called a person under investigation, a PUI. 
This person had come from the US, Washington State, where you had that first initial breakout in the US, and he presented at the hospital with all the symptoms. And we immediately went into this massive panic. We were, because we had been being told by CDC and WHO, it's coming next week. You are gonna get this. Your planes are coming in and out. You are gonna get this disease. You have to be ready. We had no testing capability. We had nothing. And we're seeing this thing, this disease spread from a couple of countries to a hundred countries in a very short amount of time. And we were terrified. So when we got this initial person who presented and we went through just a terrifying experience, isolating them. We, did, we only have one isolation unit at the time. So we isolated that person. And um, when it turned out he was negative, we just said, okay, we're not gonna deal with this anymore. We're closing the border. It was a very drastic measure. Nobody else had done this. People had talked about it, but we did it. Um, we were one of the first in the Pacific, may have been the first, and we closed their border Really, people were really criticizing us. I came into lunch one day and one of my American friends said, how does it feel to be the most hated person in Madro? I mean, that's what it was like for me as Secretary of Health, even though I was acting on a lot of advice from my medical personnel here and my public health, health personnel who are tremendous. You had an airplane, a, a United Air flight that I think you even blocked at one right. point. That, that was a big, uh, big controversy too. Um, but uh, yeah, before that, we had that happen. And then we stood out of there at the airport and just said, you're not getting off. No one's getting off that plane and even coming into our lounge. Um, and United Airlines was really upset with us. But we had a country to protect. And, and quite frankly, I didn't care about what anyone thought about it. Could you tell me um, what would have happened if you, what, what would you, what did you think would have happened if, if you did not close the borders and you, you did get a positive case? How would... How would you have handled it? Well, think? that was the problem at the time. A lot of times these days, we've built all these facilities now. We have an eight person I, I, ICU unit now, with ventilators and everything else. We, we've really beefed up our hospital both here on the EVI. But we just had no testing capability. We had no way of knowing if that disease was coming. And uh, it was quite scary because we weren't sure what to do. Nobody knew what to do. Everybody, the whole world was in a panic at that time. And I can tell you that even WHO was telling us when we closed the border that border closures don't work. They said that more than once. And thank God, I, as secretary, I just listened to my own people. They said, we don't care about what people are saying. Let's just do it. So in the beginning, it was very controversial. But within two weeks, all of a sudden, a lot of the other Pacific countries saw what we were doing. And they just said, we're doing that too, because it's an island and you have that advantage. And so our public health team worked up a bunch of protocols and things we, were, we, we had shipping ports. We're one of the busiest shipping ports in the Northern Pacific, maybe in all of the Pacific. Uh, we have a huge ship registry. So we, we uh, and a lot of fishing goes on here. So we um, had to deal with airports and seaports, and it, it became quite intense because a lot of people didn't like it. It was economically, it was hard for us because we depend on that. Um, but we figured if uh, COVID got in here for us, it would be worse uh, economically than if it did. And so you right now, there are no flights still coming into Majuro as well as ships. It's, it's all shut down. Is that the current state? No, no, no. We, we have ships, but no one can get off of them. Like for example, uh, our container ships come, there's no human to human contact. They offload the containers. Um, some of fishing is still in, uh, going on in the region. We have one flight a week for a uh, month from United where we're bringing in people in a repatriation effort. It's very strict. It's uh, two weeks in Honolulu where you get tested tw uh, twice, um, once before you get in and actually twice when you are in. So you're actually tested three times, including an antibody test. It's very strict. It's single key entry uh, into the room. You can't leave the room. They bring you your food and leave it at your doorstep and then leave again. And then you come into our Kwajalein military base um, here in the Marshalls and you spend another three weeks. Again, very strict quarantine. My wife's up there in Kwajalein right now in quarantine. I haven't seen her in a year. She's been stuck in Oregon. Um, so um, it's, and it, that that's the only, to me, it's one of the biggest, um, downfall the, the heart the biggest hardship for us is a lot of our family members are stuck outside the marshals we allow 40 people in a month at this point 
um, on United. But again, by the time you're released from quarantine on Kwajalein, you will have been in quarantine for five total weeks, including the Hawaii quarantine, and you've been tested five times. So anybody, so anybody who's anywhere in the U.S. and wants to come back home to the Marshalls comes to Honolulu for uh, a quarantine. What, where are you? Where are people quarantining in Hawaii? It's a call right now. We're using the Pacific Monarch Hotel. A lot of the hotels in Hawaii, because their tourism industry was heavy, heavily hit, they're really happy to use their hotels for quarantine because you know you have a steady people in there for two weeks. We we take up a lot of rooms. Imagine forty people. Um, so that's how we've been doing it. So how many people have you repatriated so far? Well, if you count the U.S. military repatriations, we, we've uh, repatriated over 700 people. Um, the U.S. military is coming in once a week with about roughly 20 people. And I just want to say this right off the bat that uh, Colonel Bartell uh, is a most beloved character out here in the Marshall Islands. He's been really tremendous to work with. He's helped us set up our that quarantine facility on the military base up there. Um, and anytime we've wanted change in protocols, which we've done a couple of times, he's been really cooperative and happy to do anything. He's very strict with his own people, just like we're strict with ours. So it's something that's really worked well for everybody and uh, really, really proud of the way that's worked out. And Colonel Bartell, I think he leaves in June. It's gonna be a sad day when he leaves. I'm very happy to hear that that you have that support from Kwajalein uh, and the and the military uh, commanders there, Commander. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about other federal support that you've received in in these efforts? Uh, quite honestly, um, and again, I, I worked for Bikini for 33 years, and so I was uh, a little bit of an antagonist uh, in that role because we were representing the Bikinians and what happened during the nuclear testing. So when I compliment the US, uh, it's more than just when anybody would do it because I've, I spent most of my life actually in very good relationships with people in the US government and Congress and uh, you know a lot of lobbying effort. We, we were always uh, very cordial and, and very nice, but it was still, you were trying to rectify a wrong. But uh, I can say unequivocally that the United States, uh, what they've done for the region, uh, the Federated States of Micronesia, and uh, also Palau has been tremendous. We had testing in April. They got us that we, we have, we've had now 54, 55 US API calls. We do it every week. We had one yesterday. Uh, Dr. Thane, Dr. Brostrom uh, from CDC get on those calls. And a lot of people from like yesterday, FEMA was on there. They got us testing in April. And uh, we were uh, doing a lot of testing. And I look at the United States, My I know, we had so many Marshallese in the U.S. that just got hammered. Our communities in Arkansas, a lot of deaths. Um, my wife was in Oregon. Uh, we saw COVID just rip through the apartment complexes there. And we had a really close relative die. And almost every, anyone in the Marshall Islands now can tell you a story of someone who's died in the U.S. from this disease. The Pacific Islanders, Marshallese, were much harder hit than most other communities in the U.S. by a huge margin. So we knew this was a, a really a bad disease for us. And that's one of the things that drove us to close it off. So the US gave us the testing right away, which was huge. Cause now we didn't have to wait for a week if we had someone who was uh, suspicious of maybe having the disease, even though we had closed the borders. That gave us everything we needed. And, and when we got on those calls um, together with uh, Secretary, well now uh, Secretary Liv Livingston died this week, uh, the Secretary of Health for the FSM and. Uh, Deputy uh, Kafar from Palau, every week we would get on and we would mention about the testing. And the U.S. really came through. And the same thing happened with the vaccines. We've had such a tremendous start. We're, we're one of the best in the Pacific right now, according to the CDC reports yesterday. I, I know uh, the Marshalls is pretty near the top and the rest of the Micronesia, we're far ahead of the rest of the world, really. Um, we've we've uh, uh, done them a good portion of our most uh, vulnerable people already. So we're really happy about the US have gotten us those vaccines. We're doing the Moderna vaccine. Um, so uh, it's just been a really, uh, the US has been incredibly supportive. I have to give kudos to my own department and my own leadership for helping with uh, making sure that uh, testing kits uh, came through to you. And I know that we 
uh, Interior worked with uh, works closely with CDC and, and PIHOA, right. the Pacific Island Health Officers Association. And um, that was actually, you know, when you shut down the borders, I mean, you, because previously you were sending all your tests back to Atlanta. So right. that was just perfect that now you can, everybody, all the islands can test locally. Critical. Right. Right. And one of the most critical aspects of uh, when I look, look at this now, you know, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I think someday when we look back at history and what's happened in the world and especially in this region, this is going to be known as Micronesia's finest hour. I'm really proud of the people I work with because the way we succeeded is cooperation. And I know in the United States, you've had a lot of issues with that. But out here, it was top down. We had the president, we had the cabinet. We had uh, President Kabua, uh, our Minister of Health, Bruce Billiman, has been fantastic during this time. And we have uh, the, the National Disaster Committee headed by Chief Secretary Kino Kabua. We, we don't always agree, but we've made some really just outstanding decisions. And it, it involved, all, even now with the vaccine rollout, when we, when we opened up for that vaccine, the very first day on December 29th, when we got those vaccines, the day we got the vaccines is the day we rolled it out. That's how fast we went. And we had um, Minister Bruce, uh, our minister. We had the Chief Justice of High Court, Carl Engram. We had uh, the leader of the traditional community, uh, Kotak Loyak. We had uh, Reverend Johnny from the religious community. And then we had myself and a bunch of doctors and, and our public health nurses, our Dr. Frank, Dr. Robert, um, and we just did this big ceremony saying, we're doing this vaccine um, because, you know, there's a lot of things on Facebook and a lot of misinformation out there about the vaccine. So we decided to have a big rollout. And they did the same thing on eBuy. Um, so we made it very prominent. We had Facebook TV, I guess you would call it, you know, live broadcast. We had uh, national radio. And so we, we, I felt as Secretary of Health, if I'm asking everybody else to get the vaccine, well, then I better go, you know, at the beginning. And uh, that turned out to be a really good decision because we've been, um, we're now going door to door throughout our communities here. I don't think anyone else is doing that. If you're 18 and above, I know in the US, my mother's 86, she's in Pennsylvania, she still can't get a vaccine. And what we're doing is door to door, if you're 18 and above, we, and you want a vaccine, you can get it. You can walk into our clinic today if you want to, if you're 18 and above and get a vaccine. We're already moving into second doses. What, fantastic. What percentage of your population has, has received the first dose and, and how much further do you need to go? Well, the first dose, we're at about, uh, we're over 8,000 and that doesn't count yesterday. We're doing uh, anywhere from 300 to 500 people a day going door to door. It may not sound like a lot in your, 30, 330 million uh, people in the U.S., but for us, that's a lot. We have about 26,000 in our community here in Maduro, and we've, uh, adding eBuy in here, we've done about 8,000, and already we have about, I would say, close to 2,000 people have already got the second dose. I've already had my second dose for three weeks. So you're about 25% of the way, roughly, at least yeah. for initial shots. Yes. And every day, we're doing it six days a week, door to door. I just wanted to say that... Um, your efforts in the Marshall Islands. I remember hearing at a meeting how uh, impressed the CDC was with how you were handling dengue. And it sounds like a lot of those same practices, you're doing the same with COVID. There's 600 people in the Ministry of Health here. And I've been, I've been the Secretary of Health for a little over two years. Uh, I have not missed a day for either illness or vacation. We have not been able to take days off. It's every day. You, it, it, honestly, it's been like uh, 20 months in a foxhole with 600 people. And, it's, and we call ourselves, when we talk to, about each other in meetings and we talk, it's not teamwork. It's not a, a ministry. We talk about being a, a big family. And our approach, that really helps in our approach. Because when you're, when you're approaching it as a family, and that's really the way it is out here in the Marshalls. I have five kids and five grandkids, so I've got all these connections into the community. No, people don't look at me as Jack the American, you know, ex-American. I, I have both citizenships. It's just, you know, Secretary Jack. And we have, uh, I work with these, I have Deputy Secretaries, uh, both women. Uh, Deputy Secretary Mylene is our uh, Deputy Secretary for Public Health. 
She's led a tremendous effort. She was one of my biggest advisors in the beginning. She was one of the people along with Dr. Aina that were pushing, pushing, pushing to close this border. And we have uh, Deputy Secretary Matu who runs our planning division and is one of the best bureaucrats I've ever been around. So I'm certain, and we have uh, Dr. Frank Underwood who's been our public health currently and also Dr. Robert who's our director of health, our, I mean our uh, chief of staff. And up on EBI, we have uh, our Assistant Secretary Guarine and Dr. Nasa. We have tremendous, tremendous people. It's a very international community here. Um, and sometimes that runs into issues. Dr. Frank is from Fiji and we've got a lot of Filipino doctors and Fijian nurses, but it's when you're fighting a battle like this, it's, it's family. And I really appreciate all these people I've been working with. Just, they just really knocked themselves out. They make me look great, but they're the ones doing all this work. <laughs> I happen to know a couple of the people you're, you've mentioned, and and uh, yeah. uh, I know you commended them in another meeting I uh, was part of. And uh, uh, congratulations to to you and your entire team. Um, so, can you tell me, in terms of repatriation, how many uh, folks would you estimate still want to come home and are still waiting? Um, this is this is the hard. Like I've said before, this is the hardest aspect of the border closure. And most people are, are very understanding about it. Um, but I personally, my, my wife and daughter left just before the border closure because my, my daughter had a problem pregnancy and we just felt she, she wanted to leave and it's her baby, so off she went. Um, and then three days after they left, we closed the border. Wow. So uh, they've been living there and it's been really hard uh, on me, especially not, we, we, we talk every single day and we still do, but it's, it's, it's torture and it's, it's really hard uh, for a lot of people. We're every, we had a meeting uh, yesterday, uh, Chief Secretary Keno really wants to bring back more people. We're working with Colonel Bartel to try to figure this out because it's not just a matter of sticking a bunch of people in rooms. You have to have the ability to test. You know, right now we're testing 40 people when they come in. Imagine 80 people. You have to have the equipment and the machines to do the COVID testing. We're still working on trying to source some of these, uh, they're called gene expert machines where you can do 16 different tests uh, over the course of an hour. Um, right now we can only do three an hour with our machines. Um, so, and you also have to have staff. When you're uh, having people in quarantine as a nurse or a doctor and you're taking care of these people over a course of three weeks, you can't go anywhere either. So our doctors and nurses, mostly nurses are like on Kwajalein right now. They're in quarantine too for three weeks and they're dealing with people who want different kinds of food and all kinds of other issues, you know, your personal issues that have my wife's calling and she needs baby food and things like that, you know. So. It's, it's a real struggle for a lot of different people. So we want to make sure that when we get those people in the quarantine, we're able to take care of them. That's one of the main things and also the testing issue. Thank you for, for sharing your personal example, just to kind of highlight the, the hardships that, 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 that are associated with this whole uh, repatriation. Um, so you will have a new grandchild to welcome home. Yeah, he's 10 months old. He's already standing up and he can wave to me and, you know, uh, when I grew up, my, my father never got to see his grandchildren, and now all of my grandchildren pretty much live in my house. Uh, and it's, I go home, I rush home at the end of the day. Those grandchildren are everything to me, and we have a lot of fun. So I just can't wait to meet this little guy. Um, Secretary Niedenthal, so you touched a little bit earlier on uh, Bikini. What, what is your relationship with the Marshall Islands? I came out as a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, the day I landed here, I knew I would never leave. <laughs> um, I just became complete, and I, that's, that's a true story. I, I was completely enchanted by the place. Marshallese people are incredibly, incredibly warm people. It's not a perfect society, but when I saw this place and how people treat each other, uh, I thought this is the way life is supposed to be. And I lived on an outer island my first three years. I, Peace Corps is only two years. I asked for the third year. I was having such a great time. Uh, no airport. You're out there uh, five months before a boat comes. We went through a really bad typhoon there that destroyed almost every house. Most Peace Corps or other people living in that situation, I think would have left. But I, I just love those people out there out in Namu, and I just decided that this was for me. And I spent uh, an extra year there. 
um, really learn the language well, because out there at that time, in the early 1980s, if you didn't learn the language, you were pretty much talking to yourself most of the time. So you had to learn the language and there were fantastic storytellers. I'm a storyteller myself. I've done a lot of films and I've written a book. So I love the storytelling. And then what happened was I was just about to leave the Marshall Islands after those three years. And somebody heard me speaking Marshallese in a restaurant, a bikini, and they said, hey, we really need somebody like you. You know, we're, we're trying to negotiate for this trust fund and we have lawyers and trustees and money managers. Um, and we were thinking about moving to Maui. Could you go to Kili where they were living at the time and be a teacher? So I said, okay, one more year on the Outer Islands. Well, that turned into three years um, working with the people of Bikini. And then unfortunately, Ralph Waltz, who was the liaison between the Bikinians uh, and the uh, US government passed away. And the mayor of Bikini at the time, Tanaki Judah, just said to me, you go do what Ralph was doing. I had no idea what that was necessarily, but I went in there and that was 19, the very late 1986. And I did that job for 30 years. Um, so, and I was an advocate for them and I, I translated for them. I worked with their old people, which was just one of the most marvelous experiences in my life. And I went to college for four years, but the education I got from those older Bikinian men and women was 10 times more valuable to me, the lessons I learned from those people than what I learned in college. So I was really well taught. And so uh, I did that for 33 years and then I decided I would retire. Uh, that lasted about eight months because my youngest son decided he wanted to go to medical school and I figured I'd better find an income somewhere. Um, so I uh, went off and started looking for a job and they had just started the Red Cross here. They still were not recognized by the International Committee of the Red Cross. So I decided that would be a good thing for me to do. I like uh, job. when I do a job, I like doing jobs that have a purpose and a meaning. So we did that and within five or six months, uh, we, made, we achieved all the requirements to get recognized by the International uh, uh, Red Cross. And so we were recognized. I think uh, it's a long process, but uh, that was something that was really gratifying. I did that for two years, a tremendous experience. And then all of a sudden I saw the, the Secretary of Health position open up and I just said to myself, that's what I wanna do. You know, I'm 63 now. That's what I want to do with my life. And I can still remember the interview. Um, I went into the Public Service Commission and they asked me the first question and I spoke for 35 minutes. And they <laughs> taught me and they said, Jack, we still have like 19 more questions. Um, that's how badly I wanted this job. So um, I'm really happy that they gave it to me. Yeah, I'm going to ask um, Philippe. Uh, he, he works with me and supports this project if he would like to ask a question. Well, thank you so much, Tanya. Secretary Niedenthal, one question for you. How does your office coordinate health services with the outer islands of the Marshall Islands? We have an entire division um, that we have just for the outer islands. And right now we're training uh, 18 new health aides. That, that's one of the things that's been very, also very gratifying about my job. Uh, I get to read the Hippocratic Oath to new doctors. And we, we, I've sworn in now four new Marshallese doctors um, in the past a year and a half, and we also just did 10 uh, Marshallese nurse practitioners, which is kind of a level between a nurse and a doctor. Um, really, really uh, big events for us. And we have more doctors in training. My son's going to, going to go to medical school. Um, so we really want to get the Marshallese involved. And uh, these health aides that we're training, they're all young people. Uh, I've spoken to them several times now. Um, uh, to see these 18, 20 young people who are willing to learn these things. And, and when you're, I spent six years on the outer island. When you're on an outer island and you have a health aid there, um, and sometimes you don't have airplanes, the airplanes are down, or you're on one of these islands that don't have an airport, those health aids are extremely important and they have to be really well trained. We have a, a woman named Dr. Ina, a Marshallese, training those people right now, and they're learning a lot. I, I've been down there. So, the outer islands are really important. And like I said, the, the medical care out there, you have a little dispensary and it's gonna be really hard when we, when actually to get back to the COVID thing, we wanna immunize people on the outer islands, but you can imagine we have 29 atolls out here and we have to be able to go out there. And if it's two doses, logistically to send our teams out to do that is really, challenging. So now we're hearing that the Johnson and jo Johnson vaccine may be uh, 
uh, approved by the, the, the uh, FDA very soon. So the, the single dose vaccine for Outer Islands would be perfect because yes. we go out and vaccinate people and then we're done. Yes, and thank you for that question, Philippe, because it points out that the Marshall Islands, you mentioned, Mr. Secretary, 29 atolls over a huge, probably half the size of the United States. Yeah, and that's the, when you when we hit had the dengue outbreak. That's the other thing we had to do. No one could go to Outer Islands. So this was like around Christmas time, and all these people. Christmas is a really big uh, holiday here, and we were just preventing these people from going out because we didn't want that disease on Outer Islands. And we did eventually. We just had to let people start going back, and we have had a few outbreaks on Outer Islands. But we send those nurse practitioners out there. It's almost like a medical SWAT team. And they put that down every time we've had a little outbreak on an outbreak, we put it down every single time. How so do you really travel? How, how do you, how is the travel, uh, Mr. Secretary? What, what do well, you use to travel? Well, we, most of the islands, uh, outer atolls have airports, but what you have to understand is there's a, you have an atoll with a bunch of little islands. And so there's usually a center island where most people live, but then you have outer islands in the outer of, of the outer atolls. So to get to those people with regard to uh, medical care, you have to use boats. And we use, we've use we used boats to medevac people also, some of the atolls that are closer by. So it's boats and planes um, generally. That's really the only options we have. How important um, are, com are compact funds for, 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 the sec for the Ministry of Health? Compact funds are life and death, to be honest with you. They're absolutely necessary. The support the U.S. gives the Ministry of Health is absolutely critical, and we hope it continues. I know they're starting to renegotiate another compact with the U.S. Um, I was here for the very first compact vote. Um, NAMU Atoll voted 100% to approve the compact. It was the only atoll in the Marshall Islands that did that. I don't know how that happened, but uh, we were really uh, proud of that. Um, I remember that vote. But uh, people in here have a, a really good relationship with the U.S. Over, uh, I think, like 30% of our people actually live in the U.S. now. Um, so it's, it's a really, really important relationship to us. And as I've said, it's, it hasn't been a perfect relationship. But I can tell you now, like the U.S. ambassador that's here, Roxanne Cabral, and Jeremy Bartel, Colonel, the Colonel up in Kwajalein. These are really great people. I, I really, if, if, I, if I could give out medals of honor as the Secretary of Health, both of them would get one because they've been so important. Taiwan's been a good help too. They, they've come through with a lot of the refrigeration things and uh, I really wanna say something nice about them too because Taiwan has been, they come to me and say, what do you need? And all the time. And that's a really nice thing. That's been the same with the U.S. Ambassador and Colonel Bartel. Just, just incredibly supportive. And I'm not just saying that. I really mean it. It's, it's, it's literally been life and death for us. When I think about what would have happened to this place if that disease has gotten, gotten in here, and it may still get in here, but we're so better prepared now. We've built facilities. We have testing capability. We have vaccines. And all of that is, is the U.S. government and with some, a lot of support from Taiwan too. So, um, wow, I mean, like I said, someday in his, they're gonna look back at this time and, and this is gonna be the finest hour for not just us, but I think the US in terms of helping this region. How about um, nonprofit organizations? The Ministry of Health gets, there's a, uh, an organization, for example, called With Me Here, Women, Women United uh, Together in the Marshall Islands. Um, that has been really um, helpful to us. And um, so they help us with like the cancer drives, cancer, you know, cervical cancer is the number one killer of women out here. So we've been trying to get this HPV vaccine uh, out to the young girls and boys here. That's a really hard thing to do here, but we've been working on that. So that, that particular organization has been one of the most critical ones that have helped us. And a lot of other people just, we have businesses here. Yesterday we had a uh, business called Easy Price. They knew our people were out in the field um, doing vaccinations from door to door. I can't, you, you have to understand how hard that is going, knocking on people's doors saying, you want a COVID vaccine? And this business just came in and gave us like 10 cases of water. Um, things like that. And like I said, it's this uh, big, it's just a huge amount of cooperation throughout our entire community. That's that's helped us succeed. Um, we've been speaking with uh, Secretary Jack Niedenthal, Secretary of Health in the Republic of the Marshall Islands. 
Um, Mr. Secretary, do you have any um, additional thoughts that you want to share with us, maybe that we haven't covered or that you wanted to reemphasize? Well, um, you know, I, I'd like to uh, especially thank our public health nurses, uh, Chief Nurse Hiroko and uh, Charles Lamai and um, all of these nurses uh, who have gone out every day, uh, gone door to door, uh, those to me are um, very heroic people. It's, it's it being, being anything in the health field here in the Marshall Islands is tremendously hard. We have pressure on us all the time. So I just wanna thank those people and especially, uh, I wanna thank our, our minister, uh, Bruce, who's, uh, you know, politicians are what they are, but when you have somebody uh, who supports you. I mean, oftentimes you, you see the problem and, and you can see the solution, but in between there, there are money issues. And sometimes it's not even a money issue, it's bureaucracy. And that's when the politicians, if they're good, they can help you get through that. So he's been really helpful. All of us here really think uh, a lot of him for helping us like that. Um, so I, I just think that there's a lot of people here. I wish I could name everybody. Um, I, when I start saying names, sometimes I worry because I'm going to forget somebody, but um, I think they understand I'm 63 and uh, that's part of the game when you're this old. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, just a lot of people who have uh, done a lot of work here and have been very helpful. I just really appreciate uh, what they've done. I'm really proud to be a Marshall Island citizen. And, and it sounds like you're also proud to be an American citizen, given the important uh, collaboration oh. that has taken place. <laughs> oh, yes. I mean, if I had a single wish, I wish the cooperation we have here would go back to the U.S. for all. You know, that's really something people have to start looking for the advantages of their similarities instead of the differences. I think that's what's happened in the U.S. And it's very sad to watch from out here. But I think with good leadership and as time goes on, I, I have faith that I think that the United States can sort this out. That's the great thing about that country. We've always managed somehow to get through a lot of these things. So if people start looking for the similarities and, and get together and decide they're gonna fight as one group of people, I think they can accomplish a lot. Yeah, actually, Mr. Secretary, before I let you go, how, um, what communications platforms do you use? How do you communicate? Well, I do Zoom calls, you know, very interesting. Uh, we were doing Zoom calls right from the start. We have a weekly meeting that lasts about three hours every week and for our hospital staff. And none of us are in the same room. It's a, it's a Zoom screen with 15 screens. Um, there's a few of us that are in the same room together, but most of us, because we were worried that if we had to meet under a state of emergency where this disease was here, we wouldn't be able to sit in a room together. So every week since uh, for over a year, we've been meeting by Zoom just in our own ministry. So Zoom calls and things like that are, are like gold and we're all really good at it. So uh, uh, that, that's important. I mean, it's, it's preparation, right? I mean, you, you have to be prepared. That's the single most important element uh, with this disease that I think we, again, well, I think we're, we're ahead of most countries in the world with regard to what we did to prepare ourselves. So um, that kind of, and of course, if you, I, I'm not exaggerating, I get somewhere around 200 emails a day. We have Google chat rooms, we have text messages, uh, phone calls, the amount of communication as a ministry that we do every day is amazing. And we're really, like I said, we're really, really good at it. If someone's not answering one of my questions within five minutes, I'm, I'm shocked. And sometimes I'm talking about three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. I hear my phone going off. People are communicating with each other over an issue. It's not, it's very common for me to wake up and not just me, everybody here to start communicating at three o'clock in the morning. It's, it's, it's common. Uh, so we're tired and drink a lot of coffee, but you know, we, the communications has been absolutely essential in all of this. Thank you very much. And, and you mentioned that you do um, Facebook TV earlier as well. Yeah, well, that's helped us connect with our community who are out there in the U.S. They, they, it doesn't matter if you're in the U.S., people are very proud of being Marshallese and they take huge uh, uh, amount of pride in taking part in the politics and the issues of the day here in the, in the Marshall Islands. 
And I get calls and text messages from those people all the time. And it, that, that's good because it's, uh, it's important for those people to remain connected to their culture out here. Because like I said, I, I don't mean this to be, I don't know, whatever the word is, but I feel like we live in a superior culture, not without problems, but, but the idea that everything is family here makes everything a lot better for, for our people here too. I mean, the way the society is. Well, you know, Mr. Secretary, we had a conversation, an OIA conversation with the ambassador, the Marshall Islands ambassador to the US. And his OIA conversation has been one of our most popular conversations that's on our YouTube channel. Uh, right now, over a thousand. And most of the viewers are from the United States. So I'm imagining that, that there, there are a lot of Marshallese who are watching uh, to hear what the ambassador has to say. Right, well, that's what I'm saying. It's, uh, we, we did, when, when we had our first, we had four border cases back in October, November timeframe. And we did a live uh, uh, Facebook feed for that. It's had over 70,000 views. And we're only a country of 56,000 people. I mean, you know, it's... Uh, that means take, you have a lot of friends. You have a lot of friends. And, and most of that was in Marshallese, so I don't know how many Americans <laughs> okay. are watching. But, uh, this is all, the, the, all the former Peace Corps, Mr. Secretary. Yeah, so... <laughs> uh, and they always make me speak Marshallese, and it's, uh, and it's okay. Um, as long as I'm not tired, uh, I can speak really well. But sometimes when I'm tired, the, the tongue doesn't work right. But. That's really interesting, Mr. Mr. Secretary, because we had a conversation with the Congresswoman from American Samoa, and she was talking about the success of uh, their videos and their communication as they use Samoan. So are you seeing that your communications are uh, drastically, uh, you know, more, more viewed when you, when you do the translation? I mean, it goes without saying, I suppose. Um, the ministry's always had a policy of doing both. Like when we do the newspaper ads or any kind of communications, text messages, we do, we do both languages because, well, there are a lot of people here who aren't Marshallese and, and a lot of Marshallese now these days in the U.S. don't speak Marshallese. There's, there's, you know, a lot of these kids are growing up in U.S. schools and yeah, that's just the natural, I think, uh, transfer mm -hmm. of cultures. But, uh, we're really proud of our, our language here. I, I love the language. It's, I, I, it's changed my life because I was able to listen to the old people. That was the biggest advantage for me of learning the language. It was one of my primary motivations. So after NAMA, when I, then when I went to Bikini and these Bikinians were telling these incredible Exodus stories, I was just like thanking God every day that I learned that language because I couldn't imagine not listening to that. That's, that was actually the book I wrote for the good of mankind. Um, that had all the stories that had been told to me. So it was like an oral history of the Bikinians. And that, that to me was like, what an education for a young guy. Um, and even when I took over that job in Bikini, I was only in my 20s. And I had all these old men and women relying on me and the leadership of Bikini. It was a real heady experience and a very uh, challenging experience for a very young guy. But uh, the, the mayor at that time, Tamaki Judah, just said, just do the best you can. And um, when someone like that says that to you, it's all the motivation you need. It was really uh, transformative for me as a young person. Well, uh, you know, you're an example of the important relationship that the United States has with uh, the Pacific and, and especially the Marshall Islands. So uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for, uh, you know, we at OIA are trying new platforms as well, forced by COVID, but also forced by uh, trends in communication where social media is playing such an important role for connecting people. So, you know, we ourselves are experimenting with new platforms and how to get information out about the island. So we thank you very much for, uh, for your time, taking the time to speak with us today. And, and maybe we can follow up with you in, in a few months and see how things are going. Yeah, like I said, to this point, we've been very, very fortunate. Uh, thanks to people like yourself and the people in the U.S. government. And I can't say thank you enough. I'm sure everybody here in the Marshall Islands has the exact same sentiment. Like I said, uh, uh, we think really highly of the people that out here that are helping us now. And I think going forward, uh, we hope the support stays there. I'm pretty sure it will. I have a lot of confidence in that. But uh, these are moments that make me uh, very proud is uh, you know, my American heritage is something uh, that I'm really proud of. Because like I said, for a long time, it was something I had to struggle with. 
Um, but these days, uh, I can't say enough good things about the way we've been supported out here throughout the region. I know all my uh, fellow uh, uh, health people throughout the region, throughout the freely associated states, I know we're all really appreciative of the way the, the, way the U.S. has come through um, for us. Because it was very, very, very scary. I, I just can't, uh, you just can't imagine the way we were so scared here. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary.